Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Let me start with uh, actually introducing ourselves. Um, my name is Sabine Giraud. I came here to Stanford about four years ago from Germany. And uh, I'm an oromaxillofacial surgeon, uh, which means that I have a double degree as a dentist and as a medical doctor. And um, oral surgery is a specialty training that you do after you achieve both degrees. You do four years of training in, a, in this specialty. Um, and uh, become an oral surgeon. So basically, the diseases that we treat are facial reconstructive surgery, especially bone preservation and replacement, and also implantology, which, will, which will, we, we will talk about tonight, dental surgery and jaw surgery. And uh, let me introduce my co-speaker, Dr. Indira Saival, who is a prosthodontist. Maybe you can introduce sure. yourself. I'd like to welcome everyone here, and I do see a few familiar faces. Um, so I am a prosthodontist, which means I went into extra training for three years just to learn to make teeth. That's all I do in my practice. We just make teeth for people. We do not do anything else. And um, I did my master's at Baylor in Dallas, Texas. I went to dental school at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Prosthodontics is only one of the eight specialties uh, recognized by the American Dental Association. Oral surgery is the other one out of the eight. So in my practice, the most complex thing I do is full mouth rehab, which means you could come to me with a number of broken down teeth. Some have old crowns, some have root canals, some have discolored, some have worn down with time. And then you come to me and you say, you know what? I want a brand new smile. And this is what I want. Well, I figure out a way to make it possible. And there are many ways we can do that. So that would be a full mouth rehab. You would get a total smile makeover like you see on TV. The other treatments I do are mainly implant related. That's about 80% of my practice. And some of the full mouth rehabs do involve implants because you have a few gaps I need to fill in. Um, there are a lot of people who don't have any teeth and want something fixed. Then we use implants. And we'll show you many situations where implants can be used so we don't have to depend on your other teeth and maybe weaken your other teeth by depending on them to fill in gaps you have in your mouth. I also make dentures. If someone does not want implants and just wants a plain set of dentures, well, I'm specialized to do that too. We also do crowns in my practice and veneers, which are facings on your teeth to just change the color or the shape of your tooth if you don't like it, and everything else that's involved in cosmetic dentistry. This is what I've specialized in. And you may ask yourself how we two work together. For every rehabilitation, I do the surgical part, and Dr. Sahival does all the crown part. That's actually the part that you see. I work in the dark. I do everything that you don't see. And she does everything that you see, and that makes your smile brighter in the end. What are we going to talk about today uh, is, is um, how implants can replace teeth, how they can improve your smile if you're missing teeth, how dental implants can actually help you to hold a denture. And uh, we will also let you know that uh, the development in implants has been such that in some cases today, you can actually go into your dentist's or oral surgeon's practice, have a tooth taken out, put an implant in, and get a provisionary tooth on the same day. So let's start a little bit about experiences with upper and lower dentures. I'm sure that uh, many of you have experience with these. And maybe Dr. Saival can explain what the differences are between upper and lower dentures. So a lot of people, um, till about 20 years ago, lived with dentures. Luckily for them, the amount we lived wasn't that long. But now we've started living longer and longer. And that's becoming a problem if you've had dentures for many years. Because what happens when you lose teeth is your bone loses the stimulation it needs. And it starts resorbing. It's just like a muscle. You don't use a muscle, it starts going away. Then you work it out, it comes back. Unfortunately for bone, once it's gone, you don't ever get it back. So what happens is people lose teeth, and then they start losing bone. Then the problem is multiplied by the fact that we put dentures on that bone, which people need to chew and to live a life and go out, and go out in the world. 
And what these dentures do is they're just pounding on your bone day and night. And what they're actually helping do is make you lose your bone even faster. So in about 20 years after you've had a denture, I see these patients every day in my practice. You see people coming in with dentures that are just floating around in their mouth. Nothing will hold them. No glue will hold them. So if you look at this, this is somebody who has worn a denture for a long time. And whereas people tell us that in the upper jaw, this is usually not a problem, in the lower jaw, it becomes a problem after a while, just as Dr. Saival explained. You cannot really eat anymore because the denture is just floating around in your mouth. And when they go out to dinner, uh, then they may be afraid to eat something because the denture may fall out of their mouth or they cannot really bite into something. The last resolve is the denture fixation, uh, which you use these uh, pastes for. And this is really what we want to get away from. And that's why we are talking about implants tonight. If you have a denture, inevitably, after a while, the bone gets lost because the pressure for the bone by the denture is unphysiological. So this is what happens. You originally have your own teeth, and then after a couple of years, the bone starts resorbing. You have the denture sitting on top of the bone. And in the end, there is only half of the bone that you originally started with left. And I actually have some patients that have worn dentures for 30 years where their lower jaw eventually breaks because it's so small that any little pressure on that jaw makes it break down. Again, this is a picture of how the, the situation looks like before dentures and after dentures. You can see how the lower jaw of this person shrinks. Over time, when you wear dentures, this is what happens. The lower far part of the face, face becomes shorter, and the reason for it is that the lower mandible, which we call the lower jaw, shrinks to about the size of a finger. And then anything that is a little hard that you bite into can make this structure break down. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, how implants came about. Um, about in the 50s, there was an orthopedic surgeon in Sweden by the name of Branemark, and he actually uh, discovered what's called what we now call osseointegration. He was working on uh, some animal experiments, and he showed that some titanium uh, chambers that he put into the uh, legs of animals got stuck there, and he couldn't get them out. And he had the brilliant idea that maybe for these people who have the dentures that are floating around in their mouth, maybe we can make that useful and find a way to fix dentures to the jaw with these kind of things. And uh, since then, he has done a lot of animal experiments. And you can see here that in 2002, over 1 million people have been treated with dental implants successfully. This is what he did. These were his experiments. He put these little chambers in there. And then what he found, uh, most of you probably have never seen a histological picture, but this is a picture under the microscope of the bone. And what you see here is the implant, which is like a screw. And here on this side, you see the bone. And what you see here is that the bone and the implants, there is no gap in between. And that's what's called osseointegration. The bone and the implant fuse. It's very different from your natural teeth where you have some membranes in between. But if you put an implant into the bone, if it's made out of titanium, the bone will grow on top of that implant and you cannot pull it apart. And that's why implants are successful today. With these implants, you can actually put the denture on these posts and hold it in place and it feels just like your own teeth. So implants are really a relatively new choice. I remember the first developments in the 80s when I did my, my training in Germany. I think in 1984, I pretty much remember that we put the first implant in, and it was very exciting. Since then, we have put in thousands of implants successfully and helped a lot of patients uh, with their dentures initially, and also now with single teeth and multiple teeth that are missing. So what does the implant look like? This is a cut through a tooth and through your jaw. And you see here on the left side your natural tooth. And your natural tooth is, has two components, really. It's the crown up here, and it's the root down here. And the implant is really the root of the tooth. So what I do, I place these implants, and the crowns are done by a dentist, for example, by Dr. Sahibal. So in every case, uh, you want to usually have two specialists working together. One specialist that puts in the root of the tooth and the other specialist that puts the crown on top. And these implants, as you saw before, can be used to fix dentures. They can be used to make bridges. They can be used to replace individual teeth. For example, here at Stanford, we have a very big craniofacial anomalies clinic. We see a lot of kids with cleft lips and palates. 
And I'm part of this clinic, and what we do today, these, these kids also miss teeth because of their clefts, and instead of doing, giving them a denture or giving them a bridge, we put in implants, and they look just like their own teeth. So that is how far we have come in the last 20 years. This just looks like a denture, but it cannot move around. You cannot take it out yourself. It's a plastic rim with teeth on them, which are completely in the jaw, fixed in the jaw. There's no way you can move that anywhere. And Dr. Saiva can probably explain what this looks like. So basically, when you would come back from Dr. Giraud, you would come back to me looking something like this, where you'd have the implants in your bone, and then we put on this little piece on top, which would help me screw my teeth in. There are ways where we could do this in one day, but uh, if people want to take it easier and they don't have the right amount of bone and we think you need to wait, we would wait. And this one, after your implants are ready, we could make it ready for you within a month. In between, you would wear your old conventional denture on top, so you're never without teeth. There's not a single day you have to go without teeth. Even the day she puts your implants in, you'll, you will have your teeth back on top, the old denture you're wearing. I think that's a very important point that Dr. Sayewal made here. Uh, different people require different treatment protocols. If somebody has very good bone and wants two implants to have their denture fixed, this is something that we can do in a day. But some people have not that much bone, they need bone grafting, they need other procedures, then it can take a, lot of, a couple of months until everything is ready. And here on the left side, also to illustrate, is the same situation where you see the implants in the bone and this is the final situation that you saw in the last slide. This is the upper jaw. You also have these abutments that you see here and the final denture. And this is screwed into the jaw. So you can clean it, but you cannot really take it out. Only your dentist can take it out. So it's fixed to your jaw. There's nothing that can move. You can eat steak, right? So that's very different from the dentures that you remove every day. And maybe if you have bone loss, especially in the lower jaw, they may be moving around and there's not very much that you can eat except for very soft food. And this is just the... Uh, the x-ray situation here, see this person has a lot of natural teeth in the lower jaw. So you can also do it if you have lost just your teeth in one jaw. You can just do it in one jaw. It doesn't matter what you have in your other jaw. And this is the final situation. So this is one of uh, Dr. Giraud and my mutual patients. And she came to us with this horrible looking denture. She'd been wearing this for over 15 years. And she had a lot of, all her teeth on the lower jaw had been crowned over time. And I you may be able to appreciate the fact that they all have cavities under them. And basically, she was very, very unhappy with what she had. And she wanted a total makeover. She wanted something fixed. And just in case some of you think that the only way you can have a denture fixed is to have something permanently fixed into your jaw, you don't have to do that. You could get a denture just like the one you're wearing with a few implants underneath it just to make it a little more stable. So that is always an option. Most people just prefer to get rid of anything that comes out of their mouth at night. So that's why we stress on that a little more. So this lady wanted uh, something which she didn't have to put into a glass at night. So we put an eight implants on her upper jaw and we made exactly what you've just seen. And all her lower teeth, we cleaned the cavities up, put in new crowns, and she had a totally new smile. And if you saw her after this treatment, you, she looked at least 10 years younger. So how does this work? This is just a little movie that shows you how the implants go in, which is a surgery that uh, can be done under local or sedation. And then the next step is that you put these bars on it and your denture goes on top. It basically is like a push button mechanism. This is another possibility. If you have a removable denture, it goes in like a push button and you can take it out and in. Or the other possibility would be what you saw before, where you have implants in your jaw and the denture is screwed on it so that you cannot remove it. So there are a lot of different possibilities. This is a clinical situation of the movie that you just saw. This person actually opted to be able to remove the teeth, but on this bar, just like a push button mechanism, the denture snaps in and you can remove it to clean it, but um, it's basically very, very fixed to your jaw. So there's nothing that moves again. This is an upper denture for your upper jaw. And anyone in the audience who has a denture would know, usually your whole palate is covered. And that's what most, most denture patients really complain about because they think they can't taste food uh, when their palate is covered and it's really uncomfortable during speech. So with implants, another advantage, other than increasing stability, which of course is the advantage number one, would be that you could uncover your palate. This would be a U-shaped denture. So you, you, your tongue could actually touch your palate 
in your normal course of the day, and that makes a big difference to a lot of patients. So the fu functional advantages that we are trying to um, explain is that, uh, especially for dentures, you have significantly increased retention, no more denture adhesives, and you have the ability to chew any foods. And these fixed dentures are almost like your own teeth. So the force that you can have with biting down is uh, very similar to your own, own teeth. There were a lot of studies done, and beyond the functional advantages, um, a lot of people who have these types of implant-based dentures also report that they have increased self-confidence, social activities, because now they can go out without worrying to dinners and things like that. And uh, the bridges or these dentures are really accepted as part of themselves. The other thing we want to talk about, remember we talked about how dentures make bone resorb over time. You see this person on the right here, which has bone loss, which is very severe here. As you can see, there is a shortening of the distance between the nose and the chin just because the lower face sort of collapses. This is what happens when you lose your bone, and this is what happens when you don't lose your bone. The lower facial height is maintained, and that gives you a much more youthful look. I always remember my grandmother who took her teeth out, and all of a sudden she looked very old because everything was uh, sort of falling um, apart or it got very wrinkly. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand as a child why that was the case, but uh, the reason is that you lose your bone if you wear the dentures and then when you take them out, you know, you don't have your lower facial height anymore. So bone preservation is very important. So it is not only the treatment of last resort, but you want to keep your bone in, in your body without resorbing it. Not only for dentures these implants can be used, they can also be used, for example, for single tooth replacement. Here you have a situation where somebody has lost one of the molars in the lower jaw. And one of the possibilities that we have done until 20 years ago, where, because there were no alternatives, was that we drilled the healthy teeth adjacent to this hole and then put a bridge on top of it. What that meant in some cases that people who had lost a tooth but the adjacent teeth were completely healthy, we had to what we call prep them to make, them, to make crowns on them. And that was completely unnecessary because we really only wanted to replace this tooth in the middle. And since we have implants, we can actually just replace this one tooth in the middle. We don't have to do anything to the healthy teeth. You just put an implant in that area, put a crown on top of it, and that's it. Here we have a patient, and once again, missing two teeth. And if you would go into an office uh, where implants are not a regular part of the treatment plan, the doctor would say, oh, simple. Let's just cut down this tooth, and let's just cut down this tooth, and we'll put a bridge over, and you won't have a gap anymore. Well, great. It fixed your problem that day. But what about the next 70 or 100 years you're going to live? What are you going to do? This bridge will probably have to be replaced every 10 years. Even insurance companies will uh, pay for a redo on a bridge every seven years. If an insurance company pays every seven years, you know that most bridges don't last seven years, right? And why don't they last? Because they're harder to clean. It's one big connected piece, three teeth. They're harder to clean. There's more force on the two teeth adjacent to it. All you're doing is putting force, which is meant to be taken by three teeth, onto two teeth. So you're not really helping anyone there. It's basically just covering the area. What I recommend to my patients, in fact, in such a situation, even if the patient says they'll pay me a million dollars to do a bridge, I don't do it in my practice. I think it's unethical in today's day and age to do a bridge in such a patient. I recommend you do an implant in the middle. That way, these two teeth are not touched. They're still independent. There's not more force on them. And this implant, what's it doing for you? It's going to preserve your bone. The bone is going to stay at the level at which it was the day the implant was placed. So you're going to preserve that for the next how many ever years. So you get a stronger jaw, you get to preserve your bone, you get to save two other teeth. After you do a bridge about three or four times, it's been repeated, the teeth get cut down a little more every time. And in about 40 or 50 years after you've had a bridge, not in every case, but in a lot of cases, you end up losing these two teeth. So you just get longer and longer bridges. Till one fine day, you can't do that anymore. So when we have implants, it's been proved they're over 98% successful, 96 to 98%. I don't see any reason to do a bridge unless there's a medical reason that a patient can't get implants, which is nearly impossible. Nearly everyone can get an implant today.
the way of the future and the way we are going is with the success rate that implants have, uh, that this is a very, very good treatment option that I would offer every patient to have just because of this, this reason. I mean, some of you may have had crowns on teeth and then you need a root canal and then the root canal doesn't work and then the tooth is gone, which is like a vicious circle once you start it. It's not in every case, but it's in some cases. And uh, bridges are a very good treatment, but we have newer treatments with implants that we should also look at. And there are a couple of very good advantages to, to, to do implants versus bridges. So this is the situation again. This is just um, the implants are in place with the abutments on top. Then down here you see the crowns on top of it. So they just look like your own teeth uh, when you look at them and they also function like your own teeth. Again, um, just to explain how these things work, this is your natural tooth and this is the implant and the surgeon put the implant in and then the dentist puts the crown on top. So in our case, I would put in the implant and Dr. Saival put, put the crown on top of the implant. What I also wanted to show you here, remember the picture that I showed you in the beginning with the implant, the histological picture? So you saw the implant on the right side and the bone right next to it, and there is no gap between the implant and the bone. Whereas in your natural tooth, there are these fibers here that are in between the bone and the tooth. So it's a little different, and the implant actually also integrates. That's why it is so stable. Another situation, if you're missing a tooth and you're smart enough to decide that you don't want a bridge, you could do is have a plate like this. The only problem with this is you'd have hooks on two other teeth, which would also weaken those teeth a little, and you'd have to get your whole palate covered. So this is an option uh, also. It's like a mini denture to just replace a tooth. So different ways of replacing a tooth, basically that's what we're showing you. The simplest would be to make a little plastic plate with one tooth on it. The next step would be a bridge, which is what most people do. And the third and the smartest decision for a patient would be to get a single implant in that little gap there. Usually when you get an implant, and especially if it's just one or two teeth missing in your mouth, uh, other than the dentist who's done it for you, very few people would ever know that it's an implant. In fact, no one would. Yeah, so this is a clinical example. You can have a little stay plate here, or you can have an implant placement. So you can't really tell which one of those is, is the implant. This is one of our cases where a young girl had two missing teeth on both sides, which is very similar to the kids that we see with cleft lips and palates. You see the structure underneath the crowns, the implants, and the final smile. The advantage of these situations really is that you just put the implant in that area where the tooth is missing, you put the crown on top of it and make it look like the other teeth, and you don't have to do anything to the healthy teeth. In this case, the canines are missing on both sides, and again, the final smile, the final restoration with an implant. You can also replace multiple teeth. Like, for example, if you have a situation where you only have your front teeth left and you have a partial denture that you can remove, then you can have implants, like on this side here shown, you can have, for example, three implants that replace four teeth. So you do not always need one implant for one tooth. It's also possible that you have a lower number of implants for more teeth. And here again, on this side, there are two teeth missing, and you can put two teeth on here without doing a long bridge from this very posterior tooth to this very anterior tooth. Because also when bridges get longer, just like when you build a bridge for, for a street, yeah, they become more difficult to build. And this is a young woman who lost her teeth because of an accident. And you can probably see, if you really look closer, you can see these metal things in here when she smiles. She has a little partial removable denture down there. And I don't think that she removes them very often because she probably doesn't like it. And this is the solution for this situation. Uh, three implants in this area. And this is the alternative. You either have this little partial removable denture, and you can do it this, just the same way for if you're, when you're missing teeth in the back, or you can have a couple of implants placed and have a fixed bridge that you cannot remove that just feels like your own teeth. Again, I want to make the point that you do not always have to have one implant per tooth. For example, in this situation, if you look at it, I think she's replacing six teeth with three implants. And this is her final situation. So you don't see these metal things on your teeth that hurt your teeth anymore. And she just has teeth in the front, just like her own, that she cleans like her own with a toothbrush, and she never has to worry about it anymore. And this is just an x-ray of a different case. And also, just to show you here, if you look at your teeth, this just 
looks as if it were your own teeth. So it's very hard for a lay person actually to see whether that's an implant or just like your own tooth. This is her smile before and after. So she doesn't have to worry about taking this thing out anymore, which probably doesn't make her look very nice. So this was another young boy, and he got into an accident and lost his last three teeth on the top jaw. And uh, here, a bridge was not even an option, even if he really wanted it, because we don't have a tooth at the end. You need two teeth to do a bridge. So he would have been stuck with something like a plate for the rest of his life, which he would have had to put in a little glass next to his bed at night. And I, I really don't think that would have been a fun situation for a person who was 22 to start with. So luckily for him, we did have something called implants. And we put in three implants and gave him four teeth. And as you can see in the final picture, I mean, it's impossible to say that he didn't have his own teeth. So this is another lady. She's actually in her 60s. And she'd lost just a few teeth at the back. And um, there was a lot of force on her front teeth. And we, um, they were starting to sort of go outwards because she was chewing a lot in the front since she didn't have teeth at the back. And she would have lost her front teeth if she went on like that for a few more years. So all we did was just put in about three implants at the back, give her some chewing surface where she should be chewing, which is at the back of her mouth. And we helped save her front teeth and plus give her a better chewing capability. I see a lot of patients that really don't like their partial dentures. And um, I think that uh, implants for these situations are a very nice alternative because you can basically build up the back of your jaw again into a normal occlusion, what we call, which is the bite, how the, bite, the teeth bite together. I mean, this is um, also one of our patients, 76, mm -hmm. very active. So this is what she looked like when she came originally. And you can see that she has no teeth in the back here on both sides. And this is what it looks like when she smiled. And she wasn't very happy with that. So she had uh, implant placement on both sides. She had three implants on, on the upper jaw. And then um, we put uh, teeth on top of it. And this is her final smile. OK, I think that is everything we wanted to explain to you. And uh, we'll open the uh, audience for questions. The first question, is there bone preservation? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, if you put the implants in, they, um, they keep the bone in your jaw, and the bone loss is much less than if you put a denture on. We have implants now with good studies for about 25 years, and it shows that if you have implants for 25 years, the bone, is signif bone loss is significantly less than if you don't have implants. And uh, the reason is probably that uh, these implants and the uh, forces that are exerted on the bone are the same as your natural teeth. So the bone loss is a little more than your natural teeth, but very similar. The second question was, do you have um, a chance of damaging a nerve in the lower jaw? Yes, definitely. Um, there is a nerve in the lower jaw that makes uh, the, the sensation in your lip. It's not when you move your face, so you won't see it, but it feels like as if you had a local anesthesia by a dentist, something like that, if this nerve gets injured. And there is a risk in the lower jaw because the nerve runs through the jaw and comes out here in the chin that this nerve may, may be damaged. But um, you take preoperative uh, before you, when you plan the implants, you take x-rays. You can actually take special 3D x-rays and look exactly where the nerve is, and then you measure and you choose the length of the implants such that they are not too long so that you don't touch the nerve. If you have a lot of bone there, like when you have your natural teeth, the implant can be almost the size of your natural tooth root. So the question was, is the depth of the implant the same as the natural tooth? Not necessarily. It depends on how much bone there is. We always want to have the longest possible implants, but we also have implant in different diameters. So we want to have the biggest possible surface. And if we can't get an implant in there of a certain size, then we actually have to think about bone grafting. Yeah, that's the cutoff point. And, but still, if you have lost your bone, there's the possibility of bone grafting and then putting the implant into grafted bone. Can the tooth be extracted on the same day and the implant placed? That's a definite yes. Um, when you take out, there's only one restriction to it. Um, if you have to take the tooth out surgically and you, take too, you have to take away too much bone, then that's sometimes not possible. Then what you do, you put a bone graft in immediately, close it up, and put the, the implant in a couple of months later. Would it be preferable to have first have a root canal or have the implant right away? Um, I would think that there is a natural you know, cause of, 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 of disaster, <laughs> so to say. Uh, I would always, if a tooth is salvageable, with a, with a root canal, by all means, the root canal is the first choice. The implant is a choice if the tooth is not salvageable. So 
your own tooth is always better than a replacement, like in everything. Yeah? So everything that you do, the, what's naturally there is, is the first choice. Is a fixed bridge uh, versus a fixed denture, right? Prefer preferable. That's a question of, of finances also. Because if you put, for example, if you have a removable denture, you only need two implants to make that re removable denture solid. That's less than if you want to have a fixed uh, denture which requires eight implants and crowns on every implant. That's just, you know, that's the difference between a VW Beetle, which I very much like, or whatever. Maybe Ferrari. Or, or Ferrari, yeah, right, there we go. <laughs> but they yeah. don't come close to a Ferrari, but, don't you worry. Know, what I, you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's your choice. It's what you want, what you want to drive. If um, this gentleman would come to me, uh, what the impact or the, the financial and physical impact would be for a placement of an implant. Um, again, I, have, I would have to look at every single situation. Um, let's say you have, an, you have a molar that's lost because of you know, too big f filling, it's, it's dead, it needs to come out. What you can, what, one of the possibilities is, and there, you know, there's quite a range, is that under local anesthesia the tooth is removed, just like when you go to your dentist, the tooth is extracted, and if you have enough bone, we can place an implant at the same time. And then we wait for a couple of months in these situations where we do that immediately. And uh, then we will get a crown on top of that implant. That would be one of, the, one of the possibilities. Placing an implant, a single implant in the jaw, feels very much like when you go to your dentist and get a crown prepped. You feel a little bit of drilling. It takes about half an hour, 45 minutes. And uh, that's the physical impact. The financial impact is, uh, there's quite a range, like with everything. You know, there's a charge that stand for charges, there's a charge that the people in private practice charge. There's usually a dual charge. So there's a charge for my services and the charge for the dentist. I think the range in Palo Alto for placement of, for the implant itself um, is somewhere in between 1400 and 2000 or two and a half to three thousand dollars. And um, that's just the no, charge for the surgery. surgery. So basically, if you want a full fee for a surgeon and a restorative dentist, uh, I would say an implant would cost you one implant, somewhere between uh, four and six thousand dollars. The question is, does insurance cover any part of that? Um, insurance covers the medical, the dental insurance does, doesn't cover anything of that. Um, if you have a medical condition that why you lose your teeth or your bone or something like that, uh, very often, if you need bone grafting, the bone grafting is covered by the medical insurance. Um, if, we have, if you have a medical reason why your tooth is lost, for example, you had a trauma, you went were an accident or something like that, they would pay for, the medical insurance would pay for the implant placement. They also pay if you have an inherited condition, for example, like cleft lip and palate, or I have kids with, with a disease that's called ectodermal dysplasia. They are born with, you know, 12 instead of however many teeth you have, so they're missing a lot of teeth. In these cases, the medical insurance pays. The dental insurance, unless you have a special dental insurance, as far as I know, in general, they don't. Surgery, I don't think any insurance covers. The crown part, some will cover now, the more advanced uh, insurances. And just to clear a misconception before we go on to the next question, by saying one implant could cost you four to 6,000, I don't mean if you get eight, it's going to be multiplied by eight. Usually when you get more, it doesn't multiply. It just goes up a little. How do you clean the implants? Just like your own teeth with a toothbrush. How many people, percent of people get gum disease? Well, first of all, a lot of people lose their teeth because of the gum disease. And if you put implants in, the implants stay. Right? So implant is one part of, one way of treating gum disease. But if you don't clean your implants properly, you can get gum disease, and then the implants get lost, which is uh, a possibility, but you can prevent it by cleaning them, usually. Is there a space between the implant and the gum? Um, it depends on the situation. Really. If yeah. you have just a single tooth, there's no space. But if you have something like the denture we showed you where we have eight implants, then you have a little space. So you can clean. So where if there are many implants joined together, we give you a little space to clean. Mm -hmm. Whereas if there's a single, there's no reason to have any space. You are describing a, an implant that's a rod as opposed to a screw. Um, it really depends. I, which implants, there, there are some implant systems, a lot of implant systems out there. And I think really that the screw design is, is the one that is the most successful. Initially, when implants were placed, we actually waited six to eight months for the bone to integrate, for the, 
for the, uh, the bone to grow around it. And we are, we are getting more and more into the situation where this time frame shrinks. Yeah? So we are, we are seeing that we are also successful, for example, if we only wait three months. But this is something where we are very careful at pushing the borders. Yeah? We are, the wait time for an implant to be loaded, as we said, for the crown to be placed on is getting shorter and shorter. And it depends on the implant design, it depends on what the surface of the implant looks like, and not every system is made for that. That's a good question. So the question is, uh, am I beeping when I go through the detection yeah, at the airport? No, you won't. Yeah, the titanium. She put so, in 14 into my mom, and my mom doesn't beep. She flew back to so India. She's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, titanium is one of the metals. It's very scary that you don't detect when you, do, when you go through the, the metal detector. Can the crowns on implants break off? Yes. That is a material failure. It's not anything to do with the implant. Just like crowns can break off teeth, it's the porcelain, the material we make the teeth out of, which is not as strong as what God gave us. So they can break. Yes. Well, I can but the implants themselves are unhurt, usually. In the beginning of the century, there were a lot of makers of cars, right? And uh, everybody got a car, and then a couple of big companies came out who were actually successful in making cars. And, um, you know, the same thing happened during recently here in, in California. We had a lot of companies who were doing Internet business, and now we are slowly seeing the emergence of, of some big players. And uh, the market is sort of stabilizing. Same thing with implants. For a while, we had a lot of companies getting into the implant business, and I've seen some, pay, some implant designs that were not very good. Yeah, this and where, material. yeah, and it's really a material problem. That's why I'm saying the design of these implants, and I've seen patients where the crowns have broken off the implants, and they're, you know, these companies don't survive. It's, it's, and they're out of the, out of the picture now. And these are material problems that have been overcome. But in the past, I've seen these things, yes. But I don't think anymore. Where does the bone from the, for, the, uh, uh, for the bone grafting come from? Different areas. You can get it uh, from the skull, from the jaw, from the hip. <laughs> you can get artif use artificial bone. It depends on how much you need. If you have more, two or more implants, do you connect them together? I think Dr. Saiwa can answer yeah. that question. Once again, it depends on the situation. If you have an adequate length of implants and your bone, when she put the implants and she tells me the bone was great, uh, that usually we don't need to connect the implants. If your implant length is short and Dr. Giraud tells me, you know, when I was putting it in, it didn't feel too good, then I would connect them just to share the load. But my default would be to keep them uh, separate. Do you have to wait three to five months to get to see us? And no. Mm -hmm. I normally see about uh, a maximum of eight patients a day. That would be a big day for me. Sometimes I see two patients a day because mm -hmm. the procedures are pretty long. If an implant fails, can we take it out and put a new one in? Yes, by all means. That's what usually, I mean, if an implant fails, that's what happens. You take it out and then you put a new one in with a slightly bigger diameter if possible. I do two implant systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I use uh, a Swedish company, uh, the company of the founder, which is uh, Pierre Ingvar Branemark. It's Noble Biocare. And I use ITI. And there are two or three other players, I think, that are very good. And, but, I mean, that's my personal preference, and, and I just feel that the design of these implants and the way they handle is, uh, you know, I, I want to have a, a Mercedes quality for my implants, yeah, no matter yeah. what they cost. Because, really, the implant part is, is, is very crucial. Whether uh, the upper jaw has a nerve problem or the lower jaw, no, it's only the lower jaw, because really only in the lower jaw you have a very close proximity of the implant to the nerve, it's not in the upper jaw. Can a patient with osteoporosis not, can, not have implants? And in general, it has been shown that osteoporosis doesn't play a role for the um, success of implants. So people with osteoporosis can have implants. I'm sure, like in everything in life, there are people who like it and people who really despise it in the end. You know, But most people seem to like it, and I haven't met anybody haven't. who had successful implants who wanted to have them ripped out again. I haven't seen anything in literature either which says that no. a patient came in and got them out. No. 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 How long does it take for the face to collapse if you lose your teeth? And in my experience, it's about 25 years, okay. would you say that's yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. It takes about six months for the bone to completely adhere, and then it doesn't change anymore. It was one of these stories where somebody working with something completely different, and then he all of a sudden discovered that this is the metal that works. 
And so far, I mean, I just heard that there are some other metals that work too, but titanium is the one metal that works. Everything else doesn't work. We have a 25-year hist history of implants now and 25-year-old studies, and so there hasn't been anything adverse that we know of until now. Mm -hmm. And titanium has been around for a long time, and that's what we usually use today. Also, for, for example, if we have fractures and we use plates and stuff like that, everything is made out of titanium. What do you do in the meantime when you're waiting for your implant to heal? Yeah, you can have a little denture for the meantime, a removable thing that you can then throw out when you get your implant. Or if it's in the very back, I see a lot of patients who just say, oh, it doesn't bother me, you know, I don't need that tooth. And they've been without a tooth for a long time. It's your choice. But you can, I mean, you never, if you want, you're never without teeth. Will the dentist be scraping and polishing implants just like regular teeth? Not exactly. A similar method, we use, but we use different tools. We use plastic instruments. Uh, or gold instruments to clean implants. We don't use the stainless steel instruments because we don't want to scratch your implant or contaminate it mm -hmm. um, in case we touch the implant itself. Mm -hmm. So whenever you go, if you have an implant uh, in your mouth and you go for a cleaning to your regular dentist, it's a good idea to let the hygienist or the dentist who's cleaning your teeth know that you have an implant because mm -hmm. then they will use special instruments for the implant or they should use special instruments. Mm -hmm. How is the attachment between the titanium screw and the crown achieved? There are two ways we could do it. We could either screw your crown right into the implant, or we screw an intermediary part like you saw, like that spike, and then I could cement a crown on top. Most patients prefer a cemented crown, and uh, I uh, like to do that for them because then they don't have to look at that screw. You know, when you're smiling or something, you may see a little hole. But if you need a screw-retained crown, now even we have filling materials which blend so well that you won't know. The nice thing about having a screw-retained crown is anytime you have a problem, all I have to do is just screw it out. I've had a couple of patients where we had um, it, uh, titanium plates, and the MRI people told me, I posed that question to them, and they said, it does not interfere. Yeah, but um, I honestly can't tell you what it is with dental implants. But again, I think titanium is sort of a special case. So I don't think uh, that that's a problem. Who would do the extractions of the teeth? Um, uh, I can do the extractions of the teeth at the same time. Do implants always involve a team of a surgeon and a dentist? No, not always. There are some dentists that uh, do implants and uh, crowns at the same time, uh, do both. There is no such thing yet as a special training in implants. And um, so there is a wide variety of qualifications of implant training. And um, we work together because we are both highly specialized in these areas. But as, again, I mean, there is a wide range of qualifications of people and some just general dentists who go to an educational course may also go ahead and place the implant and then put the crown on top of it and all do it in their practice. Just to add a little angle to that and you'll get what you want to get out of it is I could have put in the implants for my own mother if I wanted to but I chose a surgeon to do it because I know a surgeon will do it right. Similarly a general dentist could go for a two-day course and say they can do it all. Anyone can do it all but Ask them how many they've done, how successful they are, how often do they do it. These are the questions you would ask. Yeah. I think like with everything, the more you do of one thing, um, the better you get. Are implants smooth on the outside and driven in, or are they threaded? Um, all, all modern de design implants are threaded. The ones we use, the ones we use are, threaded. are threaded. There are some that are smooth, but I don't think that they are that much available anymore. Then we would Thanks, like Laura, to thank you all. Yes.